Galloping through the stormy night with the piercing early spring wind at her back, 16-year-old Sybil Ludington drove her steed forward on the path to immortality. She knew the rough roads well, riding without concern for her own safety, fending off at least one highwayman with her father's musket on the way as she passed each homestead on her arduous late-night odyssey, she shouted, The British are burning Danbury! Muster at Ludington's at daybreak! The men of her father's militia sprang into action, grabbing their coats, powder horns, and muskets before mounting their steeds, and, following Sybil's warning, rallying at the Ludington house. The troops formed their unit in time to inflict significant casualties on the retreating British forces. The story of a brave 16-year-old girl thundering through the New England countryside to rally patriots to fight for freedom as she battles the inclement weather, avoids British patrols, and defends herself from highwaymen sounds like a scene straight out of Homer's Odyssey. But is it true? That's what we'll try to figure out today. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Before we dive into today's story, we want to provide a disclaimer. The story we're about to tell goes beyond the usual bounds of our timeline. However, we believe it's important to examine the central role myth-making has played in shaping our collective memory of the revolutionary era. Our goal is to explain the myth of Sybil Ludington and her semi-legendary feats, deconstruct them, contextualize them, and talk about the potential dangers that are inherent in national myth-making. With that out of the way, let's begin. We know very little about Sybil's early life. In fact, we're not even sure how to spell her name correctly. Across many different sources, it's spelled S-Y-B-I-L, or C-Y-B-A-L, or S-E-B-I-L, or even S-Y-B-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. On her tombstone, it's spelled S-I-B-B-E-L. We're going to go with the spelling S-Y-B-I-L for Sybil, since that's how she's most widely known. We do know, however, her birth date. She was born on April 5, 1761, in Fredericksburg, New York, to Henry and Abigail Ludington, the first of 12 children the family relocated when Sybil was just one year old to Dutchess County, New York, where her father owned and operated a grain mill. Though that's all we know about her childhood, we can assume Sybil likely had a traditional upbringing for a girl befitting her age and station. She likely helped her mother raise her 11 siblings and learned how to spin, weave, cook, and clean while playing games, just like any other child, but that's all speculation. On the evening of April 26, 1777, when Sybil was just 16, the Ludington family was preparing to go to sleep when a messenger burst into the house bringing disturbing news to her father, a colonel in the colonial militia. British forces under the command of Royal Governor William Tryon had launched a brutal assault on Danbury, Connecticut, which was the regional logistics hub for the militia. Even though the colonel certainly would have rallied his forces to protect their weapons, powder, and food stores, this matter was even more pressing for another reason. The town of Danbury itself was burning. What began as a routine search-and-seizure raid by British forces soon spiraled out of control as the British troops got drunk and began plundering the town. Several private homes were put to the torch, and the citizens fled into the countryside. The colonel not only had to protect his supplies, but his people as well. What supposedly happened next is unclear. Either Colonel Ludington instructed Sybil to rouse his dispersed militia, or Sybil set off on her own accord. Regardless, Sybil rode through the night and the pouring rain, helping her father assemble his unit to attack the British forces. Reportedly, she even fended off a bandit with her father's musket before returning home after a 40-mile journey, shaking, cold, and exhausted from her ordeal. 
Her ride was almost three times the length of Paul Revere's famous midnight ride. While Colonel Ludington and his men were too late to save Danbury, they nonetheless exacted their vengeance on the disorganized and drunk British column as they withdrew from the area after the Battle of Ridgefield. And that's all we know about Sybil during this time frame. Any role she later played in the Revolution, if any, is unknown. Her father received praise from many revolutionary leaders, such as Alexander Hamilton, for his role in harassing the British column. I congratulate you on the Danbury expedition. The stores destroyed have been purchased at a pretty high price for the enemy. Around the same time, some sources claim Sybil received letters of congratulations from George Washington and General Rochambeau, the commander of the French forces in North America, for her daring and certainly dangerous ride. Modern historians, however, doubt this. Research published in March 2022 by the Smithsonian debunked the letters as a myth, finding that mention of such letters first appeared in 1907 when the biography of Colonel Ludington was published. No other report of these letters exists. And letters from such momentous historical figures would certainly have been treasured by the family through the generations, making it very strange they never surfaced. When she was 23 in 1784, she married the innkeeper Edmund Ogden. They had one child together, Henry, who was born in 1786. Edmund died in 1799. Near the end of her life, in 1838, Sybil was destitute. She petitioned the U.S. War Department for a pension based on her late husband's Revolutionary War service. As she could not conclusively prove she was married to him, the request ultimately was denied. During these proceedings, Sybil herself never once mentioned her legendary ride to try and get a pension. She died shortly after that, on February 26, 1839, at the age of 77, and is buried alongside her father in the Patterson Presbyterian Cemetery in Patterson, New York. The story of Sybil Ludington's seemingly legendary ride quickly faded into obscurity, where it would remain for over 100 years. The first written account we have relaying the ride appears in 1854, in a letter written by one of Sybil's nephews, asking that her exploits be recognized during an upcoming ceremony commemorating the revolution. My Aunt Sybil rode on horseback in the dead of night through a country infested with cowboys and skinners to inform General Putnam. The story first appeared publicly in a history textbook from the 1880s. The book cites no sources to corroborate the story. It's crucial to recognize that during this time, the nation, still scarred by the Civil War, had just celebrated the nation's centennial, a tale that inspired national unity towards the patriot cause would resonate and also relay a potent message. We need to remember not just the context events supposedly happened in, but also when they first became popular stories as well. Her story really began to pick up steam only in 1907 with two works. The first of these, an article written by her great-nephew, the historian Louis S. Patrick, recounts the legendary ride we described as a fact. Later that same year, Willis Fletcher Johnson, an author and journalist, published the book Colonel Henry Ludington, a memoir, at the behest of the Ludington family. This is the work where her ride begins to take on mythical proportions. One who even now rides from Carmel to Cold Spring will find rugged and dangerous roads with lonely stretches. Imagination only can picture what it was a century and a quarter ago, on a dark night, with reckless bands of cowboys and skinners abroad in the land. But the child performed her task clinging to a man's saddle and guiding her steed with only a hempen halter as she rode through the night, bearing the news of the sack of Danbury. There is no extravagance in comparing her ride with that of Paul Revere and its midnight message, nor was her errand less efficient than his. By daybreak, thanks to her daring, 
Nearly the whole regiment was mustered before her father's house in Fredericksburg. The honors and accolades would begin pouring in shortly after that, cementing her story in the psyche of many Americans. In 1934, the state of New York started installing historical markers along Lovington's supposed route. Remember that this was less than 15 years after women gained the right to vote in 1920. Many previously anti-suffragette politicians and officials wanted to appear receptive and understanding to their new constituents. One way they could do so was by recognizing the forgotten contributions of this heroic female patriot. In 1940, a poem was written about her supposed exploits. Up, up there, soldier, you're needed. Come, the British are marching, and then the drum of her horse's feet as she rode apace to bring more men to the meeting place. Again, keep in mind the context. The first American peacetime draft was instituted on September 16, 1940, by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The poem serves as a way to inspire patriotism in the men being enlisted and also shame them. Look, soldier, at the patriotic act of your predecessor, a woman. Do you really want to be outdone by a woman? Do your duty. Sybil's memory continued after the fall of the Third Reich and the rise of the Iron Curtain. The Daughters of the American Revolution commissioned the renowned sculptor Anna Hyatt Huntington to create a large statue of Lovington near Carmel, New York in 1961, as well as other smaller sculptures. During the bicentennial celebration of the revolution in 1975, she was, after public outcry, honored with a postage stamp in the series Contributors to the Cause. In the last decade as well, she's had a movie and documentary produced about her life and her seemingly legendary exploits. The story also spread all this time in less dramatic ways too. A newspaper article in the Poughkeepsie Journal from 1961 highlighted her story to residents. Perhaps if these writers had looked at the new statue of Sybil first, they would have taken a different slant. That the young Hudson Valley girl was no revere imitation, but rather a person in her own right. A teenage tomboy with plenty of the spirit and courage which has made this country great. But finally, we arrive at the elephant in the room. Is her story true? While we'll never know for sure, the historical consensus is that it is not. This belief is based on several factors, many of which we mentioned earlier. The first account only materialized in 1854, and that came from a relative. This 1880 history textbook, as well as the article and book from 1907, give no sources other than family history. Her story gained traction when many leading intellectuals, politicians, and officials, in an era when men still dominated those professions, sought to appear more in touch with women. No letter written by Sybil ever mentions her ride. She also never brought up the ride when she was appealing for a pension in the waning days of her life. Her story is not written down elsewhere until it emerges seemingly out of nowhere. In the prologue to this series, we talked about how women were marginalized in colonial society and subordinated to men. This marginalization, coupled with their exclusion from the official historical record, gives us little concrete information about the lives of but a few women. Incredible women, to be sure, but women who have largely been overshadowed by their husbands in the historical memory. They're remembered as a mere sideshow, a complimentary attraction standing beside their legendary husband. As the conversation about gender and ethnic inequalities grew over the past century, the unwritten history of heroes and heroines from the past, like Sybil, allows different groups to mold them into whatever narrative they see fit. And we need to be careful. While some groups may see her as an exemplar of what it means to be an American, male or female, her story can, and has been, used to masquerade the gender and ethnic inequalities that remain unaddressed in our society. As the historian Paula Hunt wrote, 
She was a convenient go-to personality when a politician, scholar, or representative of the media wanted to demonstrate his or her grasp of gender issues. And the 1961 newspaper article we talked about earlier, while praising Sybil's spirit and courage, also adopts many similar misogynistic undertones. When two groups of Fish Kill Plains Girl Scouts retraced a historic route through Southern Dutchess and Eastern Putnam Counties, it was a pleasant day's outing. But what they were commemorating was no playful experience, although it involved a girl, Sybil Ludington. While the story praises Sybil's achievements and highlights her gender, we need to remember the story doesn't argue Sybil's achievements shouldn't be honored because she was a woman, but rather despite the fact that she was a woman. Then why should we remember Sybil's tale if we're pretty confident it never really happened? For one thing, her tale perfectly shows how and why myths are built and maintained, as well as the inherent dangers in national mythmaking. More importantly, perhaps, her story pays homage to thousands of nameless American women whose sacrifice for American independence has been lost over the centuries. Though history may have forgotten their names, myths such as Sybil Ludington's Night Ride help us still honor their sacrifices that allowed us the ability to, hopefully, forge a better American nation. Myths are not inherently dangerous, but they can be. As the 4th century writer Celestius wrote, Myths are things that never happened, but always are. Perhaps Hunt put it best, Sybil Ludington has embodied the possibilities, courage, individuality, loyalty, that Americans of different genders, generations, and political persuasions have considered to be the highest aspirations for themselves and for their country. The story of the lone teenage girl riding for freedom, it seems, is simply too good not to be believed. So it would seem, Dr. Hunt, it would seem. Nonetheless, let's take the time to recognize how myths can obscure and mask the inequalities and social issues of our past and present that we don't want to face. Sweeping an issue under the rug doesn't make it disappear, it just lets it fester. I hope you found this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the young Polish military engineer behind the victory at Saratoga, Andrzej Kajusko.